यदि कश्चित अनुत्पन्नो भाव संविद्यते क्वचि उत्पत्त सखी तस्म भाव उत्पद्यते सती यदि कश्चित अनुत्पन्नो भाव संविद्यते क्वचि उत्पाद्येता सखी तस्मिन Bhava Utpadhyate Sati MMK Chapter 7 Verse 17 Halfway through the chapter If any unborn thing were found anywhere, it might be born. Where that thing is in existence, what is born? Or, in a deeper meaning, if, beyond birth, some indefinite living being is realised at some ineffable place, he, she or it might be going up. Where that being is really present, what goes up? So again, we've got to... Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy work, this. You can see why in the old days, the way MMK was studied was there. The student would memorise the verse off by heart and then would go and visit the teacher and uh, the various meanings of the verse would be explored. And uh, that's the meaning of Mula in Mula Madhyamaka Karika. The root verses. So uh, this is a sort of distillation. Like it, it, it's like poetry. It's got layers and layers of, 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 of meanings to be dug out, to be explored. And again, it's uh, translating Asphagorsa over a period of eight years, one verse per day. That that's really formed the groundwork for for me uh, starting to study MMK. And I don't know what it was that guided me to take that route, but uh, I, I think it's a good route to take. To start off with Asphagorsa, which is is a story. There were two epic stories, Saundrananda, the story of Handsome Nanda, and Buddha Charita, the the story of the, of the Buddha's journey. Uh, so in a sense, they're easier. To follow along because they're in, they're, they are in a, they are epic stories they're narratives but uh, the process is the same on the surface the verses mean one thing below the surface there's plentiful hidden meaning to be dug out so in this verse let's start from the ostensible meaning of the English and go to the Sanskrit so if yadi any kashchid Unborn, anutpanaha, that's nominative singular masculine, and it, it qualifies bhavaha. So bhavaha, ostensibly, as far as the ontological arguments are concerned, bhavaha means a self-existing, existent thing, as in svabhava. Svabhava means self-existence. Uh, so bhava, in the first instance means a thing as it's conceived in the misunderstanding of the realist as it's like this table before me it exists as it is in its own right independently separately as in platonic terms the unity of the form of a table and the matter of a table that's how I, it was explained to me when I was in Japan by my teacher Nishijima Sensei and of course what Nagarjuna is saying is no that is only conventionally true the ultimate truth is the table lacks its own separate existence just like the lotus flower is nothing without the mud the water the sunshine so bhava in the opponent's lexicon means the self-existing thing, the thing that exists. So here, 
in that sense, Bhava should be, can be translated thing or existent thing. So, uh, if, yadi, any, kashchid, unborn, anutpano, with Sandy before Bhava, anutpanaha becomes anutpano. If, yadi, any, kashchid, unborn, anutpano, thing, Bhavaha, were found, sam vidyate, so sam vidyate is the same as vidyate, is found, but with sam in front of it, it means is found together. But sometimes sam vidyate and vidyate mean just the same thing, and the sam is uh, uh, just an extra syllable that helps the meter. So in the ostensible meaning, sam vidyate just means is found, and kvachit means anywhere. Yadi kashchit anutpano bhavaha sam vidyate kvachit. If any unborn thing were found anywhere, it might be born. It, sa, nominative singular masculine, but referring to bhava, the thing, so that one or that, it, utpadyeta is a uh, third person singular optative of utpad, so it might, it could be born. Yadi kaschid anutpano bhavaha sam vidyate kvachit utpadyate utpadyeta sak. If any unborn thing were found anywhere, it might be born. So the implication in the background is as in the first verse of MMK. Uh, na svato na pi parato na dvabiam na piahetu taha utpana jatu vidyante bhavaha kvachana kechana. So, no thing is found anywhere. That's the opening verse of MMK, emphasizing no bhava is found vidyate anywhere. Kvachit. So, it's bhavaha kechit, is allusion is plural, so no things are found vidyante anywhere. Kvachit. Not from the self, nasvato, not from others, na pari, na, na svato, na pi parato, not from self, nor, nor, nor from others. Na, na svato, na pi parato, na dvabiam, not as a combination of the two, na pia hetu da, nor from no cause, utpana, born, arisen, jatu, at all, vidyante, are found, na, not, kvachana, anywhere, kechana, any. Na svato, na pi parato, na dvabiam, na pia hetu taha, utpana, jatu, vidyante, bhavaha, kvachana, kechana. So no things at all, not any things anywhere are found arising from self, from others, from a combination of both, and also from no cause. That's the basic thesis. So, understood in that light, the ostensible meaning of this, if any unborn thing were found anywhere, it might be born. So what he's saying is, no unborn thing is found anywhere, and so it, won't, it can't be born. Uh, and so that, that is expressed by the rhetorical question, Kim Tasmin Bhava Utpadyate Sati. So, where that thing is in existence. So, that's a locative absolute. Tasmin is locative of tat, that. Bhave is thing. So, Tasmin Bhave means there being that thing. And then sati is locative singular of sat, which as an adjective means true or real. Uh, originally it's the present participle of as to be, so it means being, existing. So tasmin bhave sati, 
means that thing where that thing is in existence where that thing is existing and uh, before utpadya utpadyate means so kim utpadyate means is it born or what is born kim question word and uh, utpadyate is born is produced is arisen so where that thing is in existence tasmin bave sati before utpadyate bave becomes bava with sandhi so tasmin bava utpadyate sati kim tasmin bava utpadye it's difficult to do the meter when you don't start at the beginning of the of the line utpadye utpadye tasa kim tasmin bava utpadyate sati so kim tasmin bava utpadyate sati where that thing is in existence where that thing is already existing what is born so it's a rhetorical question and uh, it's the main gist of it is ontological it it's it's talking about the ontological problem that what a thought of of as existent things in the, in the mind of the realist are negated by the buddha on the grounds that it exists ness astitvam is the eternity view and it does not exist ness nastitvam is the view of annihilation the nihilistic view and pratityat pada samutpadam dependent arising the buddha taught in the middle of those two views so understood like that understanding it on, on at that level uh we've got uh, johannes bronkhorst who's a, a leading buddhist scholar in the academic world uh wrote in a in a is it a, a book i think called buddhism in the shadow of brahmanism i, I made a footnote on it two years ago and so I, this is the footnote i'll read it out in buddhism in the shadow of brahmanism Johannes Bronkhorst explains the osten ostensible point as follows uh, and I should point out that the uh, the text that Johannes Bronkhorst was reading is pronounced exactly the same but instead of a uh, sati at the end it's got a little apostrophe before the sati which means the a ah is dropped so it, in the text he was working from it's not sati it's asati so not uh, where that thing is not in existence what is born would be the question as i've translated it but this is Joh johannes bronkos uh, how he, he quotes the verse in the context of an, ontolo an ontological discussion so he, here is his uh, explanation of this ontological point what he calls correspondence one example must suffice to show how nagarjuna proved the unreality or rather the impossibility of the phenomenal world see so what a very bad expression to start off with nagarjuna proved the emptiness of the phenomenal world he was not saying that the phenomenal world is unreal he was saying that phenomena are empty so no mud no lotus what we think of as mud the phenomena of mud is, is real it's real because it's empty so to say that to say the phenomenal world is impossible you totally miss the point totally miss the point it's to say it's it's because it's my physicality if i punch you on the nose is real it's not it's empty because it didn't happen as a, an event in itself it might have been a, an expression of my deep-seated resentment going back for 50 years or maybe thousands of years who knows but it it was it's 
the physical fact of practicing Zazen in space is not the impossibility of the phenomenal world. It's practice in emptiness. You couldn't be more failing to misunderstand what Nagarjuna is saying. Listen to again what he said. One example must suffice to show how Nagarjuna proved the unreality, or rather the impossibility, of the phenomenal world. See, I wrote to Johannes Bronckhorst when I was trying to get to the bottom of the meaning of samskaras, and uh, his reply was so dismissive. In the first place, he was quite friendly, as scholars are to each other, if they think they're going to, you know, confirm each other's bias. But if you say something a bit idiosyncratic, they immediately don't want to have anything to do with you. And uh, I, I, pr I proposed to Johannes Bronckhorst that samskaras, how about translating it as doings? It seemed to me that would open up a lot of stuff to explore if you understood samskaras, <clears throat> as Alexander Totes wrote about doings seemed to me so important when I was getting to the bot starting to get to the bottom of, of Nagarjuna that samskaras are doings. The point is not to do samskaras. And so Johannes Bronckhorst, you know, was very dismissive in his reply. And it's like I've been studying I've been studying samskaras. I've written books on samskaras, you know. Nowhere does samskaras mean doings. That's because you haven't actually understood what samskaras means, I'm afraid. So, again, one example must suffice to show how Nagarjuna proved the unreality, or rather the impossibility, of the phenomenal world. In order to understand his argument, we must recall that both Buddhist and Brahmanical thinkers agreed that the objects of the phenomenal world correspond to the words of language. Seems like he's somewhat in, influenced by Wittgenstein type uh, philosophy, doesn't it? Nagarjuna extended this idea slightly so that it came to mean that the words of a sentence correspond to the things described by that sentence. This is what I call his correspondence principle. No one in Nagarjuna's time and after it objected, which allows us to conclude that both Buddhists and Brahmins considered the idea in this expanded form unexceptionable, un unexceptionable. You see, he's kind of arrived at a philosophical conclusion, as opposed to Pariksha, exploring, looking into things deeply. It covers statements such as Mary reads a book Everyone agrees that this statement describes a situation in which Mary, her book, and the act of reading have their place. But Nagarjuna applies the same idea to statements such as Mary makes a pot. The situation described by this statement does not contain a pot and is therefore in conflict with the correspondence principle. Nagarjuna does not conclude from this that there is something wrong with this principle. No, he concludes from it that it is impossible to make a pot. He expresses this, for example, in the following verse. And now he's going to translate verse 17. But you see, his conclusion is that Nagarjuna concludes that it is impossible to make a pot. No, he does not conclude that. He, imp he concludes that it's impossible to make a non-empty pot. It's impossible to make a pot as a self-existing thing. And that is not an ontological argument. It's a bloody practical argument. Because making pots or making compost or growing lotuses or growing strawberries is what we're here to do in the real phenomenal world. It isn't to sit in a bloody library upholding the, the correspondence principle, whatever the hell that is. 
So here's how Johannes Bronckhorst translates the verse. I'll, it's a perfectly literal translation, so I'll, I'll go from Johannes Bronckhorst English back to the Sanskrit. If yadi any kaschid unproduced anutpano entity bavaha is found samvidyate anywhere kvachit it sa could be produced utpadyeta perfectly literal since that entity does not exist so that's uh, tasmin bhava tasmin bhave asati as i said before you can't blame him for saying put it in a negative because that's how the text was before Shao Yong Ye amended it. So, since that entity does not exist, more literally, where that entity does not exist, it's locative. Tasmin Bave Asati, where that entity does not exist, or since that entity does not exist. What is produced? Kim Utpadyate. You see, so as a translation of the, of the Sanskrit, you, since he's a little bit dubious, it should be where that entity does not exist, but close enough. As a translation from the Sanskrit with Asati, it's literal enough. But he's only, take, he's only taken there, uh, he's taken that verse out of context without understanding even the broader ontological argument at the ostensible level, still less as he understood the real argument, still less as he understood about what it means, what the metaphor of the light and the darkness is all about. So it's... Uh, it just goes to show you, really, the, the danger of making these conclusions, these ontological conclusions, and uh, I'm sure in future years people will say, look, this idiot Mike Cross thought it meant this, and he did totally fail to understand the deeper mean meaning that it, that it could mean this and that and that. But this, anyway, is the deeper meaning, a deeper meaning, as I've m managed hitherto to excavate it. If, yadi, beyond birth, anut pano, so the beyond birth, goes back to the dedicatory, dedicatory verses. Ani rodam anutpadam. Beyond death, beyond birth. If yadi, beyond birth, anutpano, some indefinite, kaschid. So kaschid means the, uh, it means so, it means any, but it's, it's in the indefinite. It makes ka, which means uh, who or what. It makes it indefinite. So, with poetic, some poetic license, I've translated Kashchid as some indefinite. And then living being, Bhava. So you see, Bhava in the opponent's lexicon means a real self existing thing. But Bhava also means being, and it means a living being. An empty living being, in other words, because in order to live, a being must be empty. If a being was not empty, he couldn't breathe. So it's like a pot. A pot could be a non empty, self existing thing which doesn't exist except in the mind of the opponent. But a, a pot could be something like this something, never mind the ontology of it. Excuse me as I. Give a bit of air to the fire. Never mind the ontology of the pot. Because it's empty, you can drink out of it. That, that's the other meaning of a pot. So the same word has got, the, has got two meanings. A pot can be a self-existing, it can be conceived as a self-existing thing as it is. Zen realism. The pot is the pot. It's, it's, the, it's the, the material manifestation of the platonic form of a pot. And, but ultimately, in a concrete, real phase, 
it's in the third phase, a pot is a pot. And in the fourth phase, probably the, the Rinzai Zen master would throw the pot on the floor and it would smash into a thousand pieces. Nagarjuna's Naga Juna's teaching isn't like that. Nagarjuna's teaching is like like Thich Nhat Hanh says. The pot is empty of itself. It's full of coffee at the moment or half full. So let, let me just say the verse as a whole in a deeper meaning. If beyond birth some indefinite living being is realized at some ineffable place. He, she, or it might be going up. Where that being is really present, what goes up? So if you understand it like that, it's more like a poem, isn't it? That's pointing to something ineffable. It's asking, it's not asking a rhetorical question. It's asking an open question. What the hell is this? What, what does it mean to go up? So again, back to the word by word. If, yadi, beyond birth, anut panor, some indefinite, kashchid, living being, bhavaha, is realized, sam vidyate. So, in the deeper meaning, the sam has meaning, because vidyate means is found, is known. Sam vidyate is, is known together is realized together. So it's not intellectual knowledge, it's the meeting of the now being in the now being visited. It's not it's not the meeting exactly of subject and object because there is no subject and there is no object. But it's it's an integral realization. So is realized at some ineffable place. Kvachit means somewhere or kvachit means anywhere. Again, it's the indefinite, it's an indefinite place at some ineffable place. So if beyond birth, some indefinite living being is realized at some ineffable place. So what's being suggested is it's not a non-empty thing at a definite place. You know, it's not some definite thing at some definite here and now, you know, like in the power of now, it's empty. It, it, the deeper meaning is that something is happening in emptiness. And when something happens in emptiness, that thing that's happening is an indefinite thing. It's not a thing with a beginning and an end, with definite limits. It's a happening. So if beyond birth, some indefinite living being is realized at some ineffable place, ineffable place, sa, which means nominative singular masculine, ostensibly it means, well, it means bhava. So ostensibly it means that thing. But if it's a living being, you would say not it, but he, if it's nominative singular masculine. But uh, if, if you wanted to be... Uh, politically correct, you'd avoid the masculine, you'd say he or she. But then, in fact, you'd be committing the, the sin of being binary, wouldn't you? You'd be missing out the, the person who's neither he nor she. So he, she or it, I, I've translated it. And uh, the thinking behind that is kind of what I was saying yesterday. It doesn't bloody matter if it's he or she or it. The point is, is he, she or it going up? So, he, she or it, sa, ut, pad, yeta. That's third person to give the optative of ut, pad, to go up. Ut, pad, yeta, sa. He, she or it might be going up. If beyond birth, some indefinite living being is realized at some ineffable place, he, she, or it might be going up. So understood like this, the verse is just a continuation of what what he's been dis what he's been exploring about the meaning of Utpada, the Utpada of the title. 
the utpad of the title is going up, which is the same as stiti, staying still, which is the same as banga, dropping off body and mind. Cessation. So then the question is where that being is really present, kim, sorry, tasmin bhava sat, tasmin bhave sati, tasmin bhave, that being, that living being, sati, on the face of it means is existing, but sati also means, sat also means real, true, really present. So, tasmin bhave sati, where that being is really present. To me, if I understand that in my own experience, I'm standing there with my hazel stick on the path, looking around the forest and the, the farmer's field all around and the trees growing up and the compost heaps that I've made and so on, and I'm, I'm in my element. Bump. That is being really present. It's like the, the opera singer I was describing yesterday that stands there and booms it out. You know, owning like a tiger. What is it? Ryun or Mizu or Uruga Gotoku. Like a dragon that's found water. Tora no Yama ni Yoru ni Nitari. Like a tiger before its mountain stronghold. That's how Master Dogen described If you get the point of Zazen, you were like a dragon that found water, or like a tiger before its mountain stronghold. You're in your element, not in a dusty library, up to your neck in ontology. Where that being is really present, Tasmin Bave Sati. What goes up? Kim utpadyate. Yadi kaschi tanutpano bavaha sam vidyate kvachit. Utpadye tasa kim tasmin bava utpadyate sati. If beyond birth some indefinite living being is realized at some ineffable place he she or it might be going up where that being is really present what goes up यदि कसिद अनुत्पन्नो भावः संविद्यते क्वचित उत्पत्ति तस्किम तस्मिन भाव उत्पत्ति सती